Welcome to ELT in Chile, a podcast about teaching English in Chile and now teaching online. In this video episode, we are interviewing Sandra Morales. Sandra Morales obtained her PhD in Educational and Applied Linguistics at Newcastle University, UK. She's an experienced language teacher and teacher training and has worked with undergraduate and postgraduate teaching students in her home country, Chile, and the UK. Her area of research is computer-assisted language learning, mainly teacher education and the use of online and blended learning resources for teaching and learning. Dr. Morales has worked in a number of research projects sponsored by the European Union and has published her work in international journals and books. Sandra has also presented in conferences such as Eurocall, World Call, Bridge Association for Applied Linguistics, and TESOL Chile. So Sandra, welcome to the episode. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Daniel and Jose, for inviting me. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and honored to be in this uh, special episode of your podcast. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Excellent. So we'll go ahead and we're going to get started with some questions. Um, and so our first one, Jose Luis is actually going to ask. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. So, Sandra, we would like to ask you about your uh, about teacher education, technology and tools. So how, do, how does your research relate to this? What did you, did you discover in your research related to teacher education and technology? Mm -hmm. So basically, um, I did my PhD. Um, I created a, in, in teacher education in call. Um, I designed an online course so language teachers in Chile could learn about technology uh, and how to use it in the language classroom. And it was an interesting experience working with uh, the teachers um, online because I was in the UK and they were in Chile and uh, Easter Island as well. So um, we did this kind of cycle of theory practice and reflection. Um, and that was uh, quite interesting um, because it, uh, I mean, th this model um, showed me at that time, I'm talking about 2015, what kind of, for example, materials teachers would use to learn better. Uh, and it turned out that videos actually um, worked pretty well with them. Um, and also that reflection was key to their learning and interaction with peers. Um, although that has its challenges as well, because at the beginning uh, of the course, I created this online community with them and I was very present uh, in the online community because they didn't know each other. So um, we started, you know, these interactions and conversations online, but by the end of the course, I was only giving instructions and uh, being there for questions, but they, they maintained the online community, which uh, was uh, one of the most important results that I got from, from that research because it shows how important interaction is for learning. I mean, if you don't have the teachers or members of a community uh, working together, it's going to be very difficult to reflect, obviously, and to um, uh, share ideas and come up with uh, resolutions for uh, uh, online practices in the language classroom, because that's what they uh, said in their interviews. They said, well, you know, we exchange information. Um, we talked about what we did in the classroom, and that's what you need. You need someone to hear your experiences, to help you. Um, and to know that, that there's someone out there that is having the same um, experience as you. And I think connecting that with uh, what's happening now in the pandemic, um, I think that's, uh, that's something that uh, we could use uh, looking forward uh, with the, in training teachers using um, uh, online resources. I think interaction is key for anything else that happens in online communities and with students as well. I mean, we've seen that if there's no uh, reaction from our students, it's very difficult to, uh, to teach them online. So that sounds like a wonderful project. And I think it's very, very relevant. Um, obviously in 2015, you didn't know the pandemic was coming, but the <laughs> no. fact of you know building an entire online course, training teachers, and getting teachers to the point of them interacting with each other and helping each other solve their own problems. I think that's very, very valuable. And I think that that is something that would help so many teachers. Um, and I think that one thing that Jose Luis and I both value is community, bringing people together. Yes. So that's wonderful to see. You've already been doing that for five years now. 
um, um, you know, before the pandemic happened? Yes, because I mean, um, at first, I when I first started doing research in, in technology, um, I implemented blended learning, for example, with students. And then I said, okay, well, you know, it's working, but what if I wasn't here implementing this? Or, you know, there are some teachers that are not doing it. So then I decided to focus on the teachers because, you know, I thought they are the ones putting this into practice in the language classroom. So, and, and also in, in, in research, there was no information about how teachers learn. There was information about the skills you need um, to uh, teach online. Uh, there was information about the models, blended learning, online teaching. So, you know, there was this, something was missing there on, on the process of the, that the teachers went through. So that's why I decided, well, you know, I'll put up this model and, and let's see how, how it goes. And I used uh, models from teacher training, you know, from face-to-face -face teacher training that can um, be transferable to help teachers as well in, in, uh, in online settings. I mean, it's, it's not just all new and no, you, you can obviously use um, this information from uh, the face-to-face -face classroom that can be transferable. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Virtual world. Yeah, Sandra, one of the main things, I, I mean, I've been working as a teacher for a long time, more maybe 10 years. And I remember when this, the beginning of blended learning, you know, that it was basically a textbook that came with a CD that you, a software that you need to install on your computer. And, you know, but it was basically, there was no interaction, you know, that the beginning was basically textbook and some practice, you know, like listen to this, you know, uh, drag and, you know, drop and things like that. Yeah. And I mean, and that was not maybe a few years ago, but um Still, I think we have a long way to go. Maybe with the idea of interaction, I think that one, that's one of the main points, you know, because mm -hmm. just having a software, of course, and a good platform does not uh, equal, you know, like engagement, you know, with students and teachers. No, definitely not. Um, and it's, I think another important thing that I, um, uh, I learned from this uh, research is that teachers need to experience that themselves in order to teach their, <laughs> their students how to do it. Because one other thing that we've observed in the, during this pandemic is that, you know, teachers have put all this effort, um, but they hadn't been trained before. They, they hadn't, some of them hadn't experienced being part of an online community or, or um, courses, online courses. Um, so I think uh, teachers have made such a great effort, um, but it, they need to experience it first, I think, in order to, to help um, the students. And like you say, no, it's, it's not only about the platform. You can have a wonderful platform, but if the teacher and the students are not engaging, then learning is less likely um, to happen. And um, I believe, I, I, I personally, I believe that um, using simple things that um, students and, and teachers know how to use uh, can make a whole lot of difference. Um, and uh, that's, that, that's why I'm, I'm always interested in access as well whenever I implement um, technology in the classroom like do my student do my students have access to this do I have access to to this and do I know how to use it do they know how to use it um, so because that that creates some sort of anxiety for the students and for the teachers uh, as well so something that I, I would recommend to use is you know simple things you have your google your whatsapp you know you yeah. use those kind of yeah. tools and, and actually, I think that that's a good transition uh, for the next topic. I don't know, Danny, if you have a question for Sandra before that. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment that um, I think you made a few really good points. And this whole idea of teachers going through the experience of using technology. Um, and I think that going through that experience really prepares them. It puts them in the seat of their students. So then they, they know what to expect and they know how to plan things. And also in one of your papers, you talk about the idea of digital self-esteem. <laughs> and I thought that is such a huge topic with teachers. And I mean, um, I mean I'm 38. And so the thing is, I grew up with some technology, but that it, I didn't grow up with the technology that a teacher maybe that is 23, 24, 25 that they have. 
So, you know, I know how to use things, but I'm not 100% sure on everything. So um, I think that's such a huge factor and something that we need to really pay attention to. So, yeah, um, Jose Luis, you had a really good question coming up. So can you talk about that one? I don't know, Sandra, you wanted to say something about what Daniel said or... Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention um, something about, uh, you know, the digital self-esteem and, and what Daniel said, because that's exactly what the teacher said. Uh, you know, they said, oh, I feel very confident using, I don't know, Facebook or, or Edmodo. But if they, t they, they told me, oh, use a virtual world, for example, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, because they have used technology as, you know, users of, you know, email and and online shopping, things like that, but um, but not to uh, to teach uh, online. And um, they realized after all these interactions with other teachers that they had similar views about and they then similar feelings about it. Um, and by the end of the of, of the research, uh, I said, "Well, let, let's let's put this uh, let's put a name to this." And the, the first thing that came to my mind was like self esteem, how you feel um, towards technology and your skills. Um, so that's why I, I, I coined that name, and I said, "Yeah, that, that's the closest um, word I, I could use to express what they were saying." Because I mean. If you look at the skills that um, th there are taxonomies that they tell you, oh, you're competent, you're you know amazing mm -hmm. users, etc. But um, but that, that but it's not just as simple as that because you can be very competent in one tool and a basic user in another tool. So it's it, you can't just put teachers in different categories. Um, so so yeah, that's that was something very uh, interesting and and. and it reminded me of what they said as well, that how they how they felt. And after the course, they said, you know, after you know um, uh, sharing this, they 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 felt more confident as well, knowing that they didn't need to know everything mm -hmm. to implement technology, Absolutely. and that lowered their anxiety levels uh, so much. So 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 yeah, it, it was an interesting um, finding. Yeah, thank you. I think that's one of the most interesting, let's say, ideas when we both read your papers. I think that that's something that Daniel and I uh, discussed, you know, and I think this is a good transition for the next topic. So one of the main topics is a digital divide, you know, mm -hmm. so can you tell us about your view of the digital divide in Chile and also, let's say, the UK, if you see similarities, differences, or if it's... Um, yeah, well, the, the digital divide is this gap in uh, access to resources or and also knowledge. Um, so I think uh, this with the pandemic, uh, all over, it was something that came to the front all over the world, I would say. Because be, before the pandemic, if you had a student who didn't have access uh, to a computer, you would say, okay, but let's do the activity in the lab. And we're all together, so everybody has access. But, but now, you know, you have students uh, with no access to technology like computers or internet connection. So it's something very challenging for teachers to deal with. And I think it's something that we cannot ignore anymore because in the past, I mean, the digital divide has been, it's been here for ages, but we've been like, oh no, it's there in the corner, we can fix it. But now with the pandemic, it's not mm. possible. So I think... Um, now it's time to talk about it seriously and to start thinking about models that we can, uh, inclusive models, I would say, uh, in, in, in which we, we can um, have all our students um, working. And so, um, and, and I think it's not just in, in Chile. I mean, in my experience, um, you, you, you find those difficulties in, in other parts as well. Yeah, I imagine so. And I think that, you know, in a perfect world, we would have governments that would be able to provide these resources or, you know, families would make enough money um, that they would be able to provide these resources. They would have, you know, the infrastructure of a stable Internet connection. Unfortunately, we know the world is far from perfect. 
So this is one reality that has really, I think, come to the forefront with the pandemic, like you were saying. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, mean, I think, uh, Sandra, we've seen this kind of uh, divide here. I mean, me teaching uh, in Chile when you were teaching here that during the, the first semester, Sandra, as well, probably, you know, we sometimes we assume that, you know, uh, students all had access to a computer, you know, when we would say, like, can you turn on your cameras, you know, and yes. they would say, like, no, I can't because, you know, that there is a, a different space or also depending on circumstances. But um, let's say, in a way, I don't know if uh, I just I'm thinking about this uh, policy because some universities here in Chile were trying to also schools as well. Let's say to count student as present in class, they needed to have their cameras on, you know, like be actually some schools were requiring students to be wearing their uniforms, you know. <laughs> One but camera. The, wow. <laughs> exactly. So, and I think in a way, universities were wearing a little bit uh, more flexible because they were yes. they actually allowed students to have their cameras on, you know, as a, as an optional requirement, not you know as a compulsory you know measure. And I think that in a way that you know, like having students you know sitting down with their uniforms with the cameras on, I think that's a little bit too much. Yes, because I mean uh, they're letting you into their home lives as well. So. Sometimes they might feel uncomfortable uh, with having their cameras on. Uh, we don't know what's going on in their in their houses. We don't know if they have the space uh, to work. Sometimes, I mean, I know of students who would tell me, "Oh no, but my brother is next to me. My sister is in front of me. You know, there's people in the in the kitchen." So, I mean, you can't just say, "Have your camera on." I mean, of course, for us, it would be much easier to teach a class with um, people with their cameras on because when the cameras are off, as you have the experience as well, you feel like <laughs> you're teaching <laughs> into the void and you don't know what's going on. Exactly. Um, so, but, but it's not just as simple as that. And I know that universities uh, made the effort as well to support students um, with uh, internet scholarships and or, or they lend their equipment, but it's I I, I insist that it's it's not as simple as that because uh, we don't know what's going on in, in, in their homes. I mean, you can tell me, okay, yeah. here's a computer, but if I don't have connection or, or you mm. know we have to save an electricity bill, you know, there's mm. there's a lot of things to consider uh, as well. Yeah. But I think it's as it was um, our, our, it was the first time that this happened. So, um, you know, uh, now now we have more information on, on how we can we can help uh, our students or what we can consider. Yeah, I think that's a really good point with the uh, with the dress code or you know with wearing uniforms because I can see it from one point that schools want students to still take their education seriously. And so I think that when you're wearing a uniform or like if you're dressed up wearing a dress shirt and a tie, you're going to feel more professional yes. um, as a teacher. So I think that that was maybe what they were going for. But we do also have that element of being in people's homes uh, with university. I mean, I really think that we should be able to trust our students. You know, we should be able to treat them like adults. You know, we would like you to have your camera on, you know, at this, you know, when we're doing these activities. But if you need a break, you know, if you need to use the restroom, one thing or another, you know, feel free to turn your camera off. Um, and I think that treating university students like adults, I think that that would make the most sense. Um, you know, but then again, we aren't always the people making policies at universities. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, um, definitely, I think, well, now we know more about our students' realities. Um, so I think, you know, we can consider that for next time. Yeah, Definitely. I think we're learning as we go. Yes. Hmm. So Daniel, I think you have a question for Sandra. Yeah, so this is actually a big one and it's like, it's actually a three-part question. So the past, the present and the future of teaching. So. If you think about teaching pre-pandemic, <laughs> so some people are saying BC before coronavirus, how would you characterize your teaching and the teaching that you saw before the pandemic? 
Uh, well, I think in my case, I've, I've always included a technology uh, in, in, in my classes, but I felt that, you know, I was the odd one out, you know, you know, Sandra is the one, the technology person. Um, and, and I think um, that, as I said before, we, we were not considering um, or we were not understanding technology and uh, what the use of it entail in the language classroom or, or in, in, in any classroom. Um, so I, I think now, uh, thinking back, technology was, you know, like this, uh, this resource that you use something like external to make it more fun, to make it more appealing uh, for the students. Um, but now, obviously, that has uh, changed. Um, now we teach via technology. There's no other way. So the role of technology in um, the classrooms, in education, has, has changed. I think technology now is at the center of this um, change of paradigm because I, I believe that, you know, the, the educational paradigm is changing. Um, and, and, te and technology is, is at the center of that change. Um, so, you know, we'll see. And I think technology is here to stay now um, in contrast to what it was before, which was something that you occasionally use to uh, motivate your students. Mm. Yeah, I think um, going back in the United States, um, I don't know if this happened in Chile, but we always had, um, so when I was in elementary school, like in the late 80s, early 90s, we would always get super excited when we heard, that when we saw the TV cart with like the TV strapped on being rolled down the hallway into our classroom, <laughs> yeah. because that meant we were gonna watch a movie or some type of video. <laughs> yeah. And so I think at that time, you know, technology was, you know, that was the use of technology, kind of like entertainment, making, you know, making classes fun you know, yes. making classes entertaining, you know, uh, whereas now it seems like it's much more of a vehicle. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, no, it's, 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 it's not just, you know, let's watch a YouTube video or let's chat, you know, to, to, to practice simple present. It's, it's just like, let's use it so you can actually learn uh, every day. Yeah, and I think, let's say, in a way that, like you said, like our idea of technology, of course. And then if we talk about this topic with students, they're probably going to think of different websites, different apps, you know, different ideas. So like you said, Sandra, you know, like watching a YouTube video is not technology anymore. You know, when we, say, <laughs> when we ask our students, like... PowerPoint. <laughs> exactly. When students say, you know, like, uh, we're going to, we're going to create... The Facebook group is like, no, we don't even use Facebook anymore. We're using some other <laughs> types of social media. So I think, let's say that uh, has changed a lot. So I think, I don't know, Denise, if you have the next question for Sandra. Yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely agree with what you said. Things are moving so quickly. So going from the way things were in the past, um, what would you say your teaching is like now? How has your teaching changed? How has the teaching of other people um, that you know changed? Uh, well, uh, Daniel and Jose, I think something uh, very important that I consider my teaching um, has changed now is that I believe that learning and teaching has to be done in, in community with other teachers and with the students. I think it's so important to include our students um, during this time and, and, and looking forward uh, because um, I remember one, one experience that I had uh, with a particular class uh, because of, you know, these access issues that we were having with Zoom. Um, one of my students said, uh, well, I'm a gamer. <laughs> I play online games. Uh, so let me see if I can, you know, try and build up this um, platform on Dis Discord. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's called yeah. this gaming platform. Um, because uh, if, if we have a server there, uh, maybe, you know, the um, mobile data could be less and, and let's just give it a try. And we did. Uh, and I learned as well because he taught me how to use Discord. So, you know, it was this mix of world, the students and the teachers 
in order to uh, learn all together and to solve a problem that was creating difficulties. Uh, not only for me as a teacher, but for uh, the rest of the class who were not able to access to our classes. So that experience taught me a lot. And I said, well, actually, yes, we have to include our students. We have to hear their voices because they're the ones learning and uh, they can give us ideas on how to teach them better. And I think by learning from them as well, our teaching will improve and we'll be better teachers. Absolutely. I think, yeah, that, that, that's a very good point, you know, like including them. And sometimes like, like we were discussing before, sometimes they would know apps or websites that we don't even, let's say, know about. And then they, we can actually use their input and probably they can, uh, most of them are actually are, are willing to teach us and show us how to use some tools, you know, so they're willing to share some of the things that they've been using and actually creating new spaces and let's say beyond, you know, that the basic ones we just mentioned, like Facebook and, you know, even like PowerPoint and things like that, you know, so I think we can move beyond those things. So I think that's a very good point. And Daniel, if you would like to add something. Yeah, you know, that that's a really great point about learning from our students. And that reminds me back to when I taught a Corfo course back in 2012. Um, and at that time, I didn't have a smartphone. And um, I remember I, I made it clear to my students that I expected them not to be using their phones in class but I saw them all like working together and sharing their phones. And I said, okay, well, you know, what's going on, you know, uh, because it seems like everyone has their phone out. They're talking, they're exchanging information. They were setting up a WhatsApp group for the class, you know? And at that time I didn't even know what WhatsApp was. So they had created this <laughs> community, you know, like using this WhatsApp group to be able to communicate with each other, to share information if a student was absent from class and, you know, they were using their phones, they were using technology in a way that was actually helping their learning. So, yeah, and I mean, yeah, I think exactly. this is the they thing. exactly, they know how to organize themselves. Yeah, and you know, I think this is the thing, it's impossible for us as individuals to keep up with everything. So learning from our students, as you said, learning from other teachers, I feel like that's so valuable. Absolutely. So, yes, it's the idea of having learning communities and, and, and not necessarily just communities of teachers, but communities of teachers and students as well, because we're all in this together. So learning from your colleagues, learning from your teachers, I think, I mean, from your students, um, I think that's that's uh, the key from now on, I would say. And actually, I think that that's one of the topics we discussed in uh, one of our episodes in our podcast, you know, like helping each other in a way, because for example, maybe I may have some skills that uh, Daniel may not have in the other way around as well. You know, so we're, let's say in a way, so I'm really good at doing this. And what about you? You know, and I remember when, let's say this pandemic started and we went, when we started teaching, I remember some of my colleagues were really struggling because they were, let's say, in a way, like thrown into platforms like, you know, we have to use Google Meet, you have to use Microsoft Teams, you have to use Zoom, and you have to start creating your YouTube tutorials and things like that without any knowledge, you know? So it was like a really let's say like okay you have to start learning right now so it was like a really tough period for some of my colleagues i remember yes um because there, there's so many things out there and, and that's one of the issues with technology that it evolves so fast that what you learn today is you know gone tomorrow so i think the only way to 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 make it sustainable is that like to keep learning from um, your colleagues and, and now the, the students. Otherwise, it's impossible to keep up, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. So, Jose Luis, you have a few other questions. Yeah, I think, well, we, we talked about it a little bit. It was the, this idea of, uh, you know, private shared space, you know, like now we're in people's homes and students are also, let's say, seeing our homes. Uh, let's say in terms of policies, you know, because we discussed the ideas of schools, you know, like, uh, asking students to wear their uniforms to, and also let's say this happens in mm -hmm. offices as well. And what's your view, Sandra, of this, you know, like this issue of uh, people entering your homes, you know, as a teacher and you as a teacher enter entering people's homes? What's your view on that? Is like something that we should require? Is that something that should be completely optional, you know? Um, well, I think it should not be required, I think. Um, 
like I've said before, we don't know what's going on in, in our students' homes. Uh, I mean, in our homes sometimes, uh, it's, it's difficult as well. I mean, personally, uh, for me, it was very challenging to teach online having a toddler. I have a two-and-a-half-year-old, so, you know, you're teaching, and on the side, you, you have the baby there. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite challenging. So, uh, and, and, and your students don't always know that. Um, so I think it's it's a sensitive issue because um, for them as well uh, it's it's difficult to 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 know what for us to know what's going on and if you say no you have to have your camera on or you have to wear your uniform um, I think that creates uh, even more anxiety and and we surely don't need more of that in this times. I mean, the idea, and, and that creates a, 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 a difficult space for learning as well. We need to create a safe space for learning. And I think if you say, well, open your camera that, and, and, and the student's not comfortable with that, uh, it, 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 the, the student's gonna say, well, maybe next time I won't go online. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that, right? We want the opposite to, to, to make them feel that they can come to class, they can go online, whatever happens, and that we're we're there for for them to support them. So I, I don't think it should be um, a requirement. But at the same time, like I, I, I think I mentioned it before, it's it's for us as teachers, like having this black, you know, screen. <laughs> um, screen can be a bit challenging. You need that feedback. You need to know, are they learning? Are they there? Yeah. Um, certainly with teaching a language, uh, you know, even more, you need the, their reactions even more. Um, so uh, uh, so I think there are some some things to uh, to consider there in, in, in that sense, but uh, it, it's challenging, I think, for both parties <laughs> absolutely and let's say um, um daniel would you like to say something or yeah and, and i mean um i can kind of relate to it. it the the idea of like talking to a brick wall where you just don't get any response whatsoever <laughs> and you're wondering okay should i go ahead you know should i explain that again yeah and i think that is one thing with not getting any feedback whatsoever and just seeing all those you know black spaces so um, Jose Luis, you actually have a really, really interesting question um, yeah. about content creation. Yeah, because uh, as you know, Sandra, it's probably this happened to you and Daniel. I mean, this has happened to all teachers. We've been creating tons of content, you know, for our lessons. Yeah. You know, we've been creating, I mean, in my case, I've been creating tutorials, you know, videos that are on YouTube now. Uh, let's say I've been recording things for my students. You know, I've been creating Things, you know, beyond handouts, you know. So my question should be, who should own the content? Teachers, the university, both of them, you know, there should be a sort of agreement, you know, language schools or schools, you know, how how do you think this, this, this should work? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is the teacher. <laughs> you know, there, there's so much effort and so many hours of, uh, you know, work there so I think there should be some sort of agreement but my first instinct would be to say the teacher is your work uh, and you should be able to to keep it and manage it because uh, it's it's a lot of effort I mean people sometimes don't really understand or don't really know how much you know you put into creating um uh, online materials. It's not just like, oh, I will just write uh, this uh, handout here and put it up. No, you have to think about all these elements that we've been discussing here, like interaction feedback for the students, um, which is very important and challenging as well when you are teaching online. Um, so I, I, I think it's not just the, the creation of the, uh, the, the production of these materials, but also uh, what um, it, uh, the effect of these materials on, on, on the students. So I think uh, the teacher for sure should have uh, the rights, if you want to call it, uh, of, of, of the materials. Um, and I mean, obviously, the, you put them up on a, at a university um, Server, so on, on a university uh, repository, 
So, you know, the, I think the university should be involved in that as well, um, some sort of agreement, but uh, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's your materials, <laughs> the teacher's materials. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a, this is something that we've been, and I think this is a question that teachers have been asking throughout the, the semester. I've, I've heard this question many times, you know, and universe, probably uh, uh, people from universities or schools, they haven't even, even thought about this, you know, like it's not a topic that's been discussed. It's like, okay, yeah, that's a very good question because I think it also, let's say, talks about some, uh, let's say, the, the, the legality of this, you know, there must be some legal issue here in terms of, you know, like a copyright in a way. So I think that's something that I don't think it hasn't, I, I don't think this has been, let's say, uh, solved, you know, I don't know, Daniel, yeah. you have you would like to go with the next question or you have any well, comment? Well, yeah, actually this makes me think of something. I was talking actually with Tina uh, from our previous video interview. And um, she told me when she worked at companies in the United States, if she made a very, very informative PowerPoint or something that she wanted to make for her own personal use, it was actually written into her contract that anything that she created when she was at her job was property of the company. So because she had a full-time contract, you know, um, now when it comes to universities and things like that, um, not everyone necessarily has a full-time contract. You know, um, if you're working for an institute, you know, it's very, very rare you have a full-time contract. You just paid, you know, per hour for the classes that you teach. So um, I really feel that, you know, universities and language schools, institutes, they really can't fairly do that. But then again, I don't think there's a law established now. So it's a bit of a legal gray area for the time being. Yeah, yeah because they don't pay you for the time. Usually exactly. they don't pay you for the time that you use to uh, produce those materials. So like you say, they, 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 they wouldn't have the right to tell you, well, this is part of the company if they mm -hmm. haven't paid for that. Um, and uh, like you say, many teachers don't uh, work in one company or one university or one institute. So, and, and also you sometimes want to use, reuse these materials. I mean, it's totally mm -hmm. fair that you uh, use your, your videos for different classes. If you're teaching the same topic, you know, that's, that's fair enough as well. So you should be able to decide uh, when and who and how you use those um those materials because some I mean I would I, I sometimes uh, use materials that my colleagues have created and I always say I mean this is you know based on you know Jose Luis materials or I always mention them because I feel uncomfortable just using yeah, something somebody that somebody else so. created uh, as if it was mine so um, so I think that's an interesting point that you you make and something that um, universities should definitely and, and schools should definitely uh, consider. Mm, definitely. So um, going on with our timeline of before the coronavirus, where we are now and looking to the future now. So how do you see teaching and teacher education changing after the pandemic? Um, yeah, well, like I mentioned before, I think we have to create communities. I think they have to be stronger than ever uh, for the future. And in terms of teacher training, I mean, um, one of the things that I also discovered when I did my research with um, in-service teachers is that, you know, technology should be incorporated in initial teacher education. Um, but in, in, in some of the study plans, you know, they have just one course of digital literacy or, you know, how to use technological resources. Um, and I think it's just not enough. Um, I think we should rethink uh, how we prepare future teachers to deal with not only technological resources, but what we've been discussing here, the digital divide, the, the, the difficulties that their, their students might have. I remember um, one of um, the experiences that I had during the first semester is that we had to teach a class on WhatsApp only because our students um, couldn't get access to Zoom all the, uh, during the, the whole course. 
And one of the activities that we did with my colleague, because I was co-teaching, was to have them uh, to prepare a class. We said, okay, you know, your your uh, last year students, you know, prepare a class on WhatsApp, and they did it, and they, they, it was great. And one of uh, and the, the feedback that they gave us was. Uh, fantastic as well because they said now we know how difficult it is to create materials and to maintain the class. I mean, they were saying we were nervous because we don't know, we didn't know if 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 the, if the, if the others were going to reply to our uh, questions or if they were going to do the activities. So I think uh, that the preparation of teachers. Uh, I mean, the, the use of technology or the inclusion of technology in the in the preparation of, of teachers needs to be taken uh, more seriously now. Not just one course, but it needs to be, I think, incorporated, integrated in the other courses as well. And not only in the methodology courses, but in the language courses and in, in, in the pedagogy courses as well. I think that's an excellent point. And yeah, um, I think that it shouldn't just be its own standalone course, standalone unit, like what you were saying. But ideally, we would have this technology integrated all along the way into every course. That way, students see how it can be used. And by the time they graduate, then they feel comfortable using it. And they feel comfortable if they see it in another course, if they see it in another context. Definitely. And um, we have to remember that whatever we do, they are going to do as well. Uh, because you serve as a model uh, for them as well. So sometimes they say, oh, you know, in my practicum, I did what you did without what we did in class. So, so you know, it's, it's, it's like this mutual learning and preparation um, as well. And like you said, Daniel, I think it's so important to integrate um, technology in different courses. They, they, they have to be, uh, there needs to be a coherence uh, it's not just, you know, the technology course. Exactly. No, and, yeah. and particularly yeah. now uh, with, um, you know, schools going online and with teachers not knowing when um, we're going to go back to normal or schools will be opening, et cetera. So yeah, I think uh, it's very important to prepare them. Yeah, and I think, I mean, Sandra and Daniel, you you raised like a really good point because I'm teaching this uh, practicum course and like, you know, because everything has changed, you know, in the past, actually in the past, it sounds kind of funny to say like students actually <laughs> yes. went to schools Ages ago. Yeah, to, to see, to see, to observe lessons, to take notes, you know, to interact with students. But now this has changed completely. So practicum courses are also, let's say, they also need to uh, adapt, you know, and actually I think like the plan for next year is actually going to be students, you know, pre-service teachers observing online lessons, you know, to see how they're conducted, to see, like, to see what teachers are doing, you know, to see how everything is functioning in terms of flexibility. Probably with like classes, it's not going to be like 90 minutes long. So it's going to be shorter, you know. So let's say content are going to be, let's say, uh, the content start are going to be uh, less in number, of course. So everything is, is going to change. So I think... In a way, this is also going to affect not only technology, but also, let's say, the way we see teaching in general. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, Jose, because I was thinking, uh, well, do we need to have our students when we go back to, you know, the classroom, do we do we need to have them there for 90 minutes if we, you know, we can... Uh, have a, a nice uh, discussion, interaction here in class, and then, you know, something else online. So I think, like you said, the education is changing and it is going to change um, due to this pandemic and the the role of technology. I think it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change uh, as well. Um, and we have these, you know, models like flipped classroom. I mean, people have been using that uh, in which, you know, students watch a video or something and then in class they discuss. I think that's um, something that we need to further explore um, because based on my experience, and I'm sure you might feel um, the same, that sometimes you, you lose the students after a certain amount of time if you have them like sitting down uh, at their desks for a long time. So I think we can play a little bit more with the resources that we have now in order to improve teaching and meet their needs because it's, it's about what they need at the end of the day, right? 
So um, I think it's it's important to see what works, what doesn't. Um, and like you say, in the case of pre-service teachers, to help them, to support them um, for the online classroom. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely, definitely. So yeah, and I think this is the thing, adjusting to the needs of our students is really important. And I think that's one thing where we have policies in place from universities. We have a syllabus, but um, we ultimately are the teachers and we have to decide what our students need and make adjustments as necessary. So I do have one uh, last question. And that is finishing up, what resources, what alternatives can you suggest for teachers that are watching this podcast? If they do want to be incorporating more technology, if they do want to be better connecting with their students, you know, if they want to plan for online teaching in the future. Yes, well, um, I think access is the key. So, you know, you have to find the resources that you have access to and that your students have access to. In my experience, I've learned that social media, it's, it's very good for, for working with, with the students. Uh, something like Instagram, um, Facebook, Twitter even, um, can help you um, to develop language skills with your students. Um, WhatsApp, I'm, I'm, I'm a super fan now after <laughs> um, we did that, that um, that course uh, via WhatsApp with my colleague, I think it worked perfectly. And even the students said that um, they felt more confident, um, you know, recording their audios on WhatsApp and that they were they were more motivated as well because they, 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 they felt that um, they were included in this uh, uh, online community. So I think WhatsApp, it's a great resource. Google Classroom, I'm a fan, I have to say, <laughs> of the Google resources because nowadays um, everybody have, has an, a, a Google account and we can get so much uh, from, from uh, these resources that Google has. Um, YouTube, I mean, things that um, you use every day, basically. Mm -hmm. Things that students and teachers use every day. And of course, you know, you have something more sophisticated like virtual words and avatars, but I think that would be more uh, for something like more specialized, I would say. But for, for the day-to-day -day, uh, business, <laughs> I would say use what you have um, and what your students have. Definitely, definitely. So, Luis, did you have any ideas to add to that? No, I think like maybe what you just said, Sandra, I think uh, the idea is actually because there are so many tools out there, like, like way too many sometimes. Like you And you have to spend yes, some time, let's definitely. say, learning how to use that. And I think uh, right now, it's, since this was an emergency situation, but I think this will continue. In a way, we have become specialized using some, some tools. And I think we should be using whatever we know, let's say, so far. And if you would like to use something extra, you need to understand that that will require some of your time as a teacher, you know. Exactly. And uh, that's something that teachers I don't normally have. <laughs> don't usually have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I was thinking about your own research, Jose, with using Netflix and, you know, TV shows. I mean, students love that. I mean, yeah. teachers, I love that. So <laughs> it's so much fun. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think that that's that's key as well. Use things uh, like resources and materials that uh, everybody is going to uh, enjoy. Otherwise, learning uh, might not be as fun. Absolutely, <laughs> definitely, definitely. And I think that you bring up a good point of um, using things that you're already familiar with that you're already comfortable with. And I think this is one thing we can get so overwhelmed with so many things that are out there and. I personally start to feel a little bogged down and feel like I'm not doing enough because I'm not using the Flipgrid, I'm not using this website, I'm not using that mm -hmm. tool. But then again, I need to remember that I'm human and that we all have limitations and that maybe it's okay if I use a few tools really, really well. And then if I have time, maybe I'll try to incorporate the other things, but I'm not a terrible teacher if I don't do that. Of course, definitely. Like you said, teachers are human and 
and uh, we're overworked usually. Uh, so, and, and I used to think um, like that, like, oh, maybe I should use this and that. But then I said, no, I mean, as long as my students are learning and they feel comfortable with the resource we're using, they'll be fine. If we need to use something else, then again, like you both have said, you know, there's time to be considered and resources as well. Um, because we might have to install something in our computers and and our, our, our computers are going to be able to support that. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, but yeah, it is important that the message uh, to, to give teachers out there is, is that, you know, you're human and just use what you're familiar with and you feel comfortable with. Excellent, excellent. That's a really nice summary. Did you have any other questions or any other comments that you wanted to share with us? Um, not just to say uh, that, well, um, this discussion has been great. Um, and I think there's so much to talk about. But uh, basically, just to highlight this idea of uh, community of learning from your colleagues so it's, it, it, that's something that we we usually do we go to you know training sessions with other colleagues other teachers but also i think we need to incorporate our students a little bit more i, I think uh, that's that's important uh, because they have so much knowledge uh, they're up to date with technology uh, mm -hmm. and, and and they can help you as well and they feel uh, they feel good about it they, they feel involved um, and I think learning collaboratively uh, is something uh, really important uh, in technology because of what we were saying at the beginning of the interaction and this exchange of ideas um, that it's important for learning as well. So just to highlight that, um, the, the idea of creating communities for, for learning. Definitely, definitely. Well, Sandra, thank you so much for being here with us. This concludes our video episode with Sandra Morales. We would like to thank you for being with us once again. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can reach us at podcast at eltandchili.com. I'm Daniel Gwim. And I'm Gosuris Foglede. So thank you, Sandra, again for no, thank taking you. the time thank to, you really, to talk really, to us. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel really honored. So <laughs> thank, well, thank I thank you, you again. <laughs> <laughs> so be able just to tell our audience to stay safe, stay healthy, and of course, keep, keep on, on teaching. teaching. <laughs> That's our <laughs> There we go.